Great. So last time we were starting to talk about just sort of the general overview of what reinforcement learning involves. Um, and we introduced the notion of a model, a value, and a policy. Um, so it's good to just refresh your brain right now about what, what those three things are. Can anybody remember off the top of their head what a value, a model, or a policy was in the context of reinforcement learning? Um, so the policy is the set of actions that um, the agent should take in the world. Exactly right. So the definition of a policy is a mapping from the state you're in to what is the action um, to take. And it might be a good policy or a bad policy, and the way we evaluate that is in terms of its expected discounted sum of rewards. Does anybody remember what a model was? Yeah. A model is like a representation of the world and how that changes in response to agent's action. Yes, yeah. right. So normally we think of a model incorporating either a reward model or a decision uh, or, or a dynamics model, which specifies in response to the current state and uh, an action how the world might change. It could be a stochastic model or a deterministic model. Um, and the reward model specifies what is the expected reward um, that the agent receives from taking a state in a particular action. So what we're going to talk about today is um, thinking about if you know a model of the world, so you know um, what happens if you take an action in a particular state, or what the distribution of next states might be if you take an action, um, how we should make decisions. So how do we do the planning problem? So we're not going to talk about learning today. We're just going to talk about the problem of figuring out what is the right thing to do when your actions may have delayed consequences which means that you may have to sacrifice immediate reward in order to maximize long-term reward. So as we just stated, um, the model generally we're going to think about are statistical or mathematical models of the dynamics and the reward function. Um, a policy is a function that maps the agent's, age, uh, this agent's states to actions, and the value function is the expected discounted sum of rewards um, from being in a state um, and or an action, and then following a particular policy. So what we're going to do today is sort of um, build up from Markov processes um, up to Markov decision processes. And this build, I think, is sort of a nice one because it sort of allows one to think about what happens in the cases where you might not have control over the world, but the world might still be evolving in some way. Um, and think about what the reward might be in those sort of processes for an agent that is sort of passively experiencing the world. Um, and then we can start to think about the control problem of how the agent should be choosing to act in the world in order to maximize its expected discounted sum of rewards. So what we're going to focus about on today, and in most of the rest of the class, is this Markov decision process, um, where we think about an agent interacting with the world. So the agent gets to take actions, typically denoted by A. Those affect the state of the world in some way. Um, and then the agent receives back a state and a reward. So last time, we talked about the fact that this could, in fact, be an observation instead of a state. But that when we think about the world being Markov, we're going to think of an agent just focusing on the current state. Um, so the most recent observation, like you know, whether or not the robot's laser rangefinder is saying that there are walls to the left or right of it, as opposed to thinking of the full sequence of prior history of the sequences of actions taken and the observations received. Um, as we talked about last time, you can always incorporate the full history to make something mark off. Um, but most of the time today, we'll be thinking about sort of immediate sensors. If it's not clear, feel free to reach out. So what did the Markov process mean? The Markov process is to say that the state that the agent is using to make their decisions is a sufficient statistic of the history, which means that in order to predict the future distribution of states on the next time step, here we're using t to denote time step, that given our current state st and the action that is taken at, this is again the action, um, that this is equivalent to if we had actually remembered the entire history, where the history, recall, was going to be the sequence of all the previous actions and rewards and next states that we have seen up until the current time point. And so essentially, it allows us to say that the future is independent of the past, given some current aggregate statistic about the present. So when we think about a Markov process or a Markov chain, we don't think of there being any control yet. There's no actions. Um, but the idea is that you might have a stochastic process that's evolving over time. 
Um, so whether or not I invest in the stock market, the stock market is changing over time. And you could think of that as a Markov process. Um, so I could just sort of be passively observing how the stock market for a particular, the, the stock value for a particular stock is changing over time. Um, and a Markov chain is, is sort of just the sequence of random states where the transition dynamic satisfies this Markov property. So formally, the definition of a Markov process is that you have um, a finite or potentially infinite set of states, and you have a dynamics model, which specifies the probability of the next state given the previous state. There's no rewards. There's no actions yet. Um, and if you have a finite set of states, you can just write this down as a matrix, just a transition matrix that says you're starting in some state. What's the probability distribution over next states that you could reach? So if we go back to the Mars rover example that we talked about last time, um, in this little Mars rover example, we thought of a Mars rover landing on Mars, and there might be different sorts of landing sites. Um, so maybe our Mars rover starts off here. And then it can go to the left or right um, uh, under different actions. Or we could just think of those actions as being A1 or A2, where it's trying to act in the world. Um, and in this case, uh, the transition dynamics, it doesn't, we don't actually have actions yet, and we just think of it as sort of maybe it already has some way it's moving in the world, the motors are just working. And so in this case, the transition dynamics looks like this, which says that, for example, the way you could read this is you could say, well, the probability that I start in a particular state S1, um, and then I can transition to the next state on the next time step is 0.4. There's a 0.6 chance that I stay in the same state on the next time step. Yeah. Um, which dimension represents the start state? Um, so this is a great question. Well, which dimension, which, which state is the start state? I'm not specifying that here. Um, uh, in general, when we think about Markov chains, we think about looking at their steady state distribution. So their stationary distribution will converge to some distribution over states that is independent of the start state if you run it for long enough. Oh, sorry. I meant to ask, like, on that matrix, which dimension represents the initial state of Oh, you mean like where you are right now? Yeah, so in this particular case, you could have it as um, the transition of saying if you start in state, uh, let me make sure that I get it right in this case. One, zero, zero, zero. So if you start in state here, um, so this is your initial start at state S1, and then you take the dot product of that with I may have, let me see if I get it right in terms of mixing it up. It's either on one side or the other side, and then I may have tra transitioned it. Um, I think you'll have to do it for the other side here. Yep, it'll be flipped. So you would have your initial state, so one, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, and then times P, and that would give you your next state distribution S prime. Yeah. Um, so what are the probabilities computed off of, like the, rewards, like it's probably based on the reward of going from state one to two or? Great question. Was, you know, what are these transition probabilities looking at? Does it relate to the reward? In this case, we're just thinking of Markov chains, so there's no reward yet and there's no actions. Um, and this is just specifying that there's some state of the, of the process. So it's as if your, let's say your agent um, had some configuration of its motors. You don't know what that is. It was set down on Mars. And then it just starts moving about. And what this would say is, this is the transition probabilities of if that agent starts in state. I can write it this way. So if it starts in state S1, then the probability that it stays in state S1 is 0.6. So the probability that if you're starting in this particular state here, on the next time step that you're still there is 0.6, because of whatever configuration of the motors were for that robot. So it requires some understanding of the world already. This is specifying that this is how, yeah, this is how the world works. So that's a great question. So we're assuming right now this is, um, the, this Markov process is a state of the world. That you are, there is some, the, the environment you're in is described as a Markov process, and this describes the dynamics of that process. We're not talking about how you would estimate those. This is really as if this is how that world works. So this is like, this is the, this is the world of the fake little Mars rover. Do we have any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, does your one hot vector need to be transposed when you're multiplying by p? Yes. I'm a little confused. Yeah. I'll be, let me just write down and correct vector notation. It would be like this. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. That would be that would be a sample starting state you could be in, for example. So this could be your initial state. 
initial state, and that would mean that your agent is initially in state S1. Okay. And then if you want to know where it might be on the next um, state, you would multiply that by the transition model P. Depending on the notation and whether you take the transpose of this transition model, it will be on the left or the right. It should always be obvious from context, but if it's not clear, feel free to ask us. And so what would that say? That would say if you took the, um, the matrix multiplication of this vector, which just says you're starting in state S1, what would that look like? Afterwards, it would say that you are in um, state S1, still with probability 0.6. You're in state S2 with probability 0.4. And this would be your new, and I think that should be transposed. But it's just a one. It, um, it would specify the distribution over next states that you would be in. May I have any questions about that? Okay. All right, so this is just specifying that the transition model over how the world works over time. Um, and it's just, uh, I've written it in matrix notation there to be compact, but if, if it's easier to think about it, it's fine to just think about it in terms of these probability of next states given the previous state. And so you can just enumerate those, or you can write it in a, in a matrix form if the, if the number of states happens to be finite. So what would this look like if you wanted to think of what might happen to the agent over time in this case, or what the process might look like? You could just sample episodes. So let's say that your initial starting state is S4. And then you could say, well, I can write that as a one-hot vector. I multiply it by my probability. Um, and that gives me some probability distribution over the next states that I might be in. And the world will sample one of those. So your agent can't be in multiple states at the same time. So for example, if we were looking at state S1, um, it has a 0.6 chance of staying in S1 or a 0.4 chance of transitioning. So the world will sample one of those two outcomes for you. And it might be state S1. So in this case, we have similar dynamics from S4. From S4, it has a probability of 0.4 of going to state S3, probability of 0.4 of going to state S4, or a probability of 0.2 of staying in the same place. So if we were going to sample an episode of what might happen to the agent over time, you could start with S4, then maybe it'll transition to S5, maybe it'll go to S6, S7, S7, S7. So you're just sampling from this transition matrix to generate a particular trajectory. So it's like the world, um, you know what the, dynamic, the, the dynamics is of the world, and then nature is going to pick one of those outcomes. It's like sampling from sort of a probability distribution. Do we have any questions about that? Okay, so that just gives you a particular episode. Um, and we're going to be interested in episodes because later we're going to be thinking about rewards over those episodes and how do we compare the rewards we might achieve over those episodes. But for right now, this is just a process. This is just giving you a sequence of states. So next we're going to add in rewards. So that was just a Markov chain. And so now what is a Markov reward process? Um, again, we don't have actions yet, just like before. But now we also have a reward function. Um, so we still have a dynamics model like before. And now we have a reward function that says, if you're in a particular state, what is the expected reward you get from being in that state? We can also now have a discount factor which allows us to trade off between, or allows us to think about how much we weight immediate rewards versus future rewards. So again, just like before, if we have a finite number of states, um, in this case, R can be represented in matrix notation, which is just a vector, because it's just the expected reward we get from mean in each state. So if we look at the Mars rover MRP, then we could um, say that the reward for being an S1 is equal to 1, the reward for being an S7 is equal to 10, and everything else, the reward is zero. Yeah? Um, are rewards always just tied to the state you're in? I no. think last time you talked about it also having an action, so why are we not considering that here? Great question, saying that um, I mentioned last time that rewards for the Markov decision process can either be a function of the state, the state in action, or state action next state. Right now, we're still in Markov reward processes, so there's no action. So in this case, um, the ways you could define rewards would either be over the immediate state or state and next state. So once we start to think about there being rewards, we can start to think about there being returns and expected returns. Um, so first of all, let's define what a horizon is. Um, a horizon is just the number of time steps in an episode. So it's sort of like how long the agent um, is acting for, or how long, it's how long this process is going on for. Um, and it can be infinite. 
So if it's not infinite, then we call it a finite Markov decision process. We talked about those briefly last time. Um, uh, but it, often we think about the case where um, an agent might be acting forever or this process might be going on forever. There's no termination of it. The stock market is up today. It'll be up tomorrow. We expect it to be up for a long time. Um, we're not necessarily trying to think about evaluating it over a short time period. One might want to think about evaluating it over a very long time period. So within this, um, the definition of a return is just the discounted sum of rewards you get from the current time step to a horizon, and that horizon could be infinite. So a return just says, if I start off in time step t, what is the immediate reward I get? And then I transition maybe to a new state, um, and then I weigh that return reward by gamma, and then I transition again, and I uh, weigh that one by gamma squared, et cetera. And then the definition of a value function is just the expected return. If the process is deterministic, these two things will be identical. But in general, if the process is stochastic, they will be different. So what I mean by deterministic is that if you always go to the same next state, um, no matter which, if you start at a state, if there's only a single next state you can go to, um, then the expectation is equivalent to a single return. Um, but in the general case, we're going to be interested in these stochastic decision processes, which means averages will be different than particular runs. So for an example of that, well, let me first just talk about discount factor, and then I'll give an example. Um, discount factors are a little bit tricky. They're both sort of somewhat motivated and somewhat used for mathematical convenience. Um, so we'll see later one of the benefits of, uh, of benefits of discount factors mathematically is that we can be sure that the value function, sort of expected discounted sum of returns, um, is bounded as long as your reward function is bounded. Um, people empirically often act as if there is a discount factor. We weigh future rewards lower than, um, than immediate rewards typically. Businesses often do the same. If gamma is equal to zero, you only care about immediate reward. So the agent is acting myopically. It's not thinking about the future of what could happen later on. Um, and if gamma is equal to one, then that means that your future rewards are exactly as beneficial to you as the immediate rewards. Now, one thing just to note, if you're only using discount factors for mathematical convenience, um, if your horizon is always guaranteed to be finite, it's fine to use gamma equal to one in terms of, from the perspective of mathematical convenience. Does anyone have any questions about discount factors? Yeah. My question is, does the discount factor of gamma always have to progress in a geometric fashion? Or like, is there a reason why we do that? It's a great question. The question was, you know, the, what we're defining here is that uh, using a gamma that uh, progresses through this exponential geometric fashion, is that necessary? Um, it's one nice choice that ends up having very nice mathematical properties. Um, uh, there, one could try using other approaches, but it's certainly the most common one. And um, we'll see later why it has some really nice mathematical properties. Other questions? Okay. So what would be some examples of this? Um, if we go back to our Mars rover here and we now have this definition of reward, um, what would be a sample return? So let's imagine that we start off in state S4, and then we transition to S5, S6, S7, and we only have four step returns. So what that means here is that our, um, uh, our process only continu continues for four time steps. And then it, maybe it resets. So why might something like that be reasonable? Well, particularly when we start to get into decision making, um, you know, maybe uh, customers interact with a website for, on average, two or three time steps. Um, there's often a bounded number of time, you know, the bounded length of a course. In many, many cases, the, the horizon is naturally bounded. So in this case, you know, what might happen in this scenario, we start off in S4, S4, S5, F6 all have zero rewards by definition. Um, and then on time step S7, we get a reward of 10, but that has to be weighed down by the discount factor, which here is one half. So it's one half to the power of three. And so the sample return for this particular episode is just 1.25. <coughs> And of course, we could define this for any particular um, episode. And these episodes generally might go through different states, even if they're starting in the same initial state, because we have a stochastic transition model. So in this case, maybe the ag agent just stays in S4, S4, S5, S4, and it doesn't get any reward. And in other cases, um, uh, it might go all the way to the left. <laughs> 
So if we then think about what the expected value function would be, it would involve averaging over a lot of these. And as we average over all of these, um, then we can start to get different rewards for different time steps. So how would we compute this? Um, now one thing you could do, which is sort of motivated by what I was just showing before, is that you could estimate it by simulation. So you could um, uh, just take, for say, an initial starting state distribution, um, which could be just a single starting state or many starting states, and you could just roll out your process. So right now we're assuming that we have a transition, transi transition matrix and a reward model. Um, and you could just roll this out, just like what we were showing on the previous couple time steps. And you could just do this many, many, many times, and then average. And that would asymptotically converge to what the value function is, because the value function is just um, the expected return. So one thing you could do is simulation. Um, and there are mathematical bounds you can use to say how many simulations would you need to do in order for your empirical average to be close to the true expected value. The accuracy roughly goes down on the order of one over a square root of n, where n is the number of rollouts you've done. So that just tells you that you know if you want to figure out what the value is of your Markov reward process, um, you could just do simulations and that would give you an estimate of the value. The nice thing about doing this is this requires no assumption of the Markov structure. It's not actually using the fact that it's a Markov reward process at all. It's just a way to estimate sums of, return, sums of rewards. So that's both nice in the sense that um, if you're using this in a process that you had estimated from some data, or you're making the assumption that things are, um, you know, this is the dynamics model, but that's also estimated from data and it might be wrong, um, then this can give you sort of, um, if you can really roll out in the world, then you can, you can get these sort of nice estimates of really how the process is working. But it doesn't leverage anything about the fact that if the world really is Markov, um, there's additional structure we could do in order to get better estimates. So what do I mean by better estimates here? I mean, if we want to um, get sort of better, meaning sort of computationally cheaper um, ways of estimating what the value is of a process. So what the Markov structure allows us to do, what the fact that, that the present, that the future is independent of the past given the present, is it allows us to decompose the value function. So the value function of a Markov reward process is simply the immediate reward the agent gets from the current state it's in, plus the discounted sum of future rewards, weighed by the discount factor, times, the, and where, where we express that discounted sum of future rewards is we can just express it with v, v of s prime. So we sort of say, well, whatever state you're in right now, you're going to get your immediate reward, and then you're going to transition to some state s prime, um, and then you're going to get the value of whatever state s prime you ended up in, discounted by your discount factor. So if we're in a finite state MRP, we can express this using matrix notation. So we can say that the value function, which is a vector, is equal to the reward plus gamma times the transition model times V. Again, note that in this case, because of the way we're defining the, tra the transition model, um, then the value function, so here the transition model is defined as the next state given the previous state, so we're multiplying that by the value function there. So in this case, we can express it just using a matrix notation. Um, and the nice thing is that once we've done that, we can just analytically solve for the value function. So remember, all of this is known. So this is known. And this is known. And what we're trying to do is to compute what V of S is. So what we can do in this case is we just move this over to the other side. So we can do V minus gamma PV is equal to R. Or we can say the identity matrix minus the discount factor times P. These are all matrices. So this is the identity matrix. Times V is equal to R, which means V is just equal to the inverse of this matrix times R. Wouldn't, uh, so if one of the transitions can be back to itself, um, wouldn't it be kind of like circular to try to express V of S in terms of V of S? Um, the question was, was, if it's possible to have self-loops 
Um, uh, could it be that this is sort of circular or defined in this case? Um, I, in this case, because we're thinking about processes that are infinite horizon, the value function is stationary, um, and it's fine if you have include self loops. So it's fine if some of the states, you might transition back to the same state. There's no problem. You do need that this matrix is well defined, that you can take the, that you can take the inverse of it, um, but for most processes it is. Um, so if we want to solve this directly, um, this is nice, it's analytic, um, but it requires taking a matrix inverse. And if you have n states, so let's say you have n states, this is generally on the order somewhere between n squared and n cubed, depending on which matrix inversion you're using. Yeah. Is it ever actually possible for uh, that matrix not to have an inverse? Or does like the property that like column sum to one or something make it not possible? question was, is it ever po possible for this not to have an inverse? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I think it's basically never possible for this not to have an inverse. I'm trying to think whether or not that can be violated in some cases. Um, if you, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You can. Yeah, so I think there's a couple, um, if there's a, if this ends up being the zero matrix, um, depending on how things are defined. Um, but I'll double check that and send a note on on Piazza. Yeah. Well, actually, I think the biggest idea of transition matrix is one. So if gamma is less than one, then that you don't have an idea of zero. Um, let me just double check so I don't say anything that's incorrect, and then I'll just send a note on on Piazza. It's a good question. So that's the analytic way for computing this. Um, the other way is to use dynamic programming. So in this case, it's an iterative algorithm instead of a one-shot. So the idea in this scenario is that you initialize the value function to be zero everywhere. Um, in fact, you can initialize it to anything and it doesn't matter um, if you're doing this until convergence. Um, and so then what we're gonna do is we're going to do what's gonna be close to something we're gonna see later, which is a Bellman backup. So the idea in this case is because of the Markov property, we've said that the value of a state is exactly equal to the immediate reward we get plus the discounted sum of future rewards. And in this case, we can simply use that to derive an iterative equation where we use the previous value of the state um, in order to bootstrap and compute the next value of a state. And we do that for all states. And the computational complexity of this is a little bit lower because it's only S squared because you're doing this for each of the states and then you're summing over all the possible next states. When I say we do this to convergence, generally what we do in this case is we define a norm. So generally we would do something like this, vk minus vk minus one. And you do this until it's lower than some epsilon. So the advantage of this is that each of the iteration updates are cheaper. Um, and there also will be some benefits later when we start to think about actions. The other thing um, that does not apply as easily when we start to have actions, but we'll see also where it can be relevant. So here are two different ways to try to compute the value of a Markov, uh, Markov reward process, or three really. One is simulation, the second is analytically. The analytical, analytic one requires us to have a finite set of states. And the third one is dynamic programming. We're also right now defining only all of these for when the state space is finite, um, but we'll talk about when the state space is infinite later on. So now we can finally get on to Markov decision processes. Um, Markov decision processes are the same as a Markov reward process, except for now we have actions. So we still have a dynamics model, but the now we have a dynamics model that is specified for each action separately. Um, and we also have a reward function. And as was asked before by Camillo, I think, um, the reward can either be a function of the immediate state, the state in action, or the state action and next state. For most of the rest of today, we'll be using that it's a function of both a state and action. So the agent is in a state, they take an action, they get immediate reward, and then they transition to the next state. So if you think about sort of an observation, you'd see something like this, S, A, R, and then transition to state S prime. And so a Markov decision process is typically described as a tuple, which is just a set of states, actions, rewards, dynamics model, and discount factor. Yeah? Because of the way you 
respond to the dynamic model? Is it the case that if you take a specific action that in, is intended for you to move to a state S prime, you won't always successfully move to that state? Like, I guess I'm curious about why there's a why it's a probability at all. Like, if you're given in a state and you take an action, why is it deterministic? what the next state is. question is saying like, well, why, is this, why are there stochastic processes, I think? Um, there are a lot of cases where um, we don't have perfect models of the environment. Maybe if we have better models, then things would be deterministic. Um, uh, and so we're going to approximate our uncertainty over those models with stochasticity. So maybe you have a robot that's a little bit faulty. And so sometimes it gets stuck on carpet, and then sometimes it goes forward. And we could write that down as a stochastic transition matrix, where sometimes it stays in the same place, and sometimes it advances to the next state. Or maybe you're on sand or things like that. Um, maybe when you're trying to drive to SFO, sometimes you hit traffic, sometimes you don't. You can imagine putting a lot more variables into your state space to try to make that a deterministic outcome. Or you could just say, hey, sometimes when I try to go work, you know, like I hit these number of red lights, and so I'm late. And other times, you know, I don't hit those red lights, and so I'm fine. So if we think about our Mars rover MDP, now let's just define there being two actions, A1 and A2. You can think about these things as the agent trying to move left or right, um, but it's also perhaps easier just to think about in general them as sort of these deterministic actions for this particular example. So we can write down what the transition matrix would be in each of these two cases um, that shows us exactly where the next state would be given the previous action. So what's happening in this case is if the agent tries to do A1, in state S1, then it stays in that state. Otherwise, it'll generally move to the next state over if it's trying to do action A1. And for action A2, it'll move to the right unless it hits 8, 7, and then it'll stay there. So like we said at the beginning of class, um, a Markov decision process policy specifies what action to take in each state. And the policies themselves can be deterministic or, sto or stochastic meaning that you could either have a distribution over the next action you might take, given the state you're in, or you could have a deterministic mapping that says, whenever I'm in this state, I always you know, do action A1. Now, in a lot of the class, we'll be thinking about um, deterministic policies. But later on, when we get into policy search, we'll talk a lot more about stochastic policies. So if you have an MDP plus a policy, then that immediately specifies a Markov reward process. Because once you have specified the policy, then you can think of that as inducing a Markov reward process. Because you're only ever taking, you've specified your distribution over actions for your state. Um, and so then you can think of sort of what is the reward, the expected reward you get under that policy for any state. And similarly, you can define your transition model for a Markov reward process by averaging across your transition models according to the weight at which you would take those different actions. So the reason why it's useful to think about these connections between Markov decision processes and Markov reward processes is it implies that if you have a fixed policy, you can just use all the techniques that we just described for Markov reward processes, namely simulation, analytic, analytic solution, or dynamic programming, in order to compute what is the value of a policy. So if we go back to sort of the iterative algorithm, um, then it's exactly the same as before, exactly the same as the Markov reward process, except for now we're indexing our reward by the policy. So in order to learn what is the value of a particular policy, we instantiate the reward function by always picking the action that the policy would take. So in this case, I'm doing it for simplicity for a deterministic policy. And then similarly, just indexing which transition model to look up based on the action that we would take in that state. And this is also known as a Bellman backup for a particular policy. So it allows us to say, what is the value of this state under this policy? Well, it's just the immediate reward I would get by following the policy in the current state, plus the expected discounted sum of rewards I'd get by following this policy and then for whatever state I end up in next, continuing to follow this policy. So that's what the v pi of k minus 1 specifies. So what would happen? The expected discounted sum of rewards we get by continuing to follow policy from whatever state we just transitioned to. So if we go to the Markov, um, uh, the, the Markov chain or the Mark now the Markov decision process for the Mars rover, 
Um, then let's look at the case now where we have these two actions. The reward function is still that you either have, um, for any action, if you're in state one, you get plus one. And in any state, any action for state S10, you get plus 10. Everything else is zero. Let's imagine your policy is always to do action A1 and that your discount factor is zero. So in this case, um, what is the value of the policy? And this is just to remind you of what like the iterative way of computing it would be. Yeah, in the back. Um, and I think it would be zero for everything except S1 and S7 where it's plus one and plus 10. That's exactly right. So this is a little bit of a trick question because I didn't show you again what the transition model is. So that is exactly correct. The, the, it doesn't matter what the transition model is here um, because gamma is equal to zero. So that means that all of this goes away. Um, and so you just have the immediate reward. So if your discount factor is zero, then you just care about immediate reward. <coughs> And so the immediate reward for this policy, because the reward for all actions in state one is always plus one, and the reward for all actions in all other states is zero, except for in state S7, where it's always 10 no matter which action you take. So this is just equal to one That's the value function for this. OK, so let's um, look at another one. So now we've got exactly the same process. Um, I've written down um, a particular choice of the dynamics model for uh, state S6. So let's imagine that when you're in state S6, which is almost all the way to the right, um, you have a 50% probability of staying there under action A1 or a 50% probability of going to state S7. That's what this top line says. And then there's a whole bunch of other dynamics models that we're not going to need to worry about to do this computation. And then the reward is still plus one for state S1 plus 10 in state S7, zero for all the states in the middle. And then let's imagine that um, we're still trying to evaluate the policy where you're always taking action A1. Um, and we've just uh, said that VK is equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 10. Um, and now what we want to do is do one more backup, essentially. So we want to move from VK equaling 1 and now compute VK equal 2. So how about everybody take a second and figure out what would be the value under this particular policy, k per s6. So you can use this equation um, to figure out, given that I know what my previous value function is, because I've specified it there, it's 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 10. Um, and now I'm going to be doing one backup. And I'm only asking you to do it for one state. You could do it for others if you want. Um, what would be the new value of S6 if you use this equation to compute it? And it just requires plugging in what is the value of the reward, the value is, and, and the particular numbers for the dynamics and the, and the old value function. And the reason that I bring this up as an example is to show sort of essentially how kind of information flows as you do this computation. So you start off in the very initial, let me just go over here first. So when you start off, you're going to initialize the value function to be zero everywhere. The first backup you do basically initializes the value function to be the immediate reward everywhere. And then after that, you're going to continue to do these backups. And essentially, you're trying to compute this expected discounted sum of future rewards for each of the states under this policy. So if you think about looking at this, that sort of information of the fact that state S7 is good is going to kind of flow backwards to the other states because they're saying, OK, well, if I'm in state S4, I don't have any reward right now. But in a couple time steps under this process, I might because I might reach that really great plus 10 state. So as we do these um, iterations of policy evaluation, we start to propagate the information about future rewards back to earlier states. And so what I'm asking you to do here is to just do that for one one more step is to say for state S6, what would its new value be? Its previous value was zero. Now we're going to do one backup, and what's its new value? So why don't you just, or let's ask a, you can ask a question, and then we can all take a second to do it. I was just wondering uh, if like, you're using the same process to also find the value function. I guess like if you don't necessarily know the value function is set, you could just like recursively follow it down. 
The question was, can you, if you don't know what the value function is, I guess I'm not totally sure. This is a way to compute the value, what your question is asking, because this is a way to compute the value function. So what we've done here is we've said, we've initialized the value function to be zero everywhere. That is not the real value function. That's just sort of an initialization. And what this process is allowing us to do is we keep updating the values of every single state until they stop changing. And then that gives us the expected discounted sum of rewards. Now you might ask, okay, well, they, are they ever guaranteed to stop changing? And we'll get to that part later. We'll get to the fact that this whole process is guaranteed to be a contraction, so it's not gonna go on forever. So the distance between the value functions is gonna be shrinking. And that's one of the benefits of the discount factor. So if people don't have any more immediate questions, I suggest we all take a minute and then just compare with your neighbor of what number you get when you do this computation. Just to quickly check that the Bellman equation makes sense. All right, so um, wherever you got to, um, hope you had a chance to sort of compare or check any understanding with anybody else that was next to you. Um, before we go on, I just want to um, answer a question that was asked before about whether or not the analytics solution is always possible um, to invert. Let's go back to that. So in this case, um, because P is a stochastic matrix, its eigenvalues are always going to be less than or equal to 1. If your discount factor is less than 1, then I, which is the identity matrix, minus gamma times P, is always going to be invertible. So that's the answer to that question. So this matrix is always invertible as long as gamma is less than 1. All right, so let's go back to this one, um, which we're going to require anyway for some of the other important properties we want. So in this case, what is that? So the immediate reward of this is 0 plus gamma times 0.5 probability that we stay in that state times the previous V of S6 plus 0.5 probability that we go to V of S7. And this is going to be equal to 0 plus um, 0.5 times 0 plus 0.5 times 10. So that's just an example of um, uh, how you would compute one Bellman backup. In the just back to my original question, which is you seem to be using B sub K without the superscript of pi to evaluate it. Oh, sorry. This should, um, yes, this is, should have been pi. That was just a typo. And okay. that's, that was correct in there. Yeah. The question was just whether or not there were, that was supposed to be pi up there. Yes, it was. Thanks for catching <laughs> All right, so now we can start to talk about Markov decision process control. Now, just to note there, so I, I led us through, or we just went through policy evaluation in an iterative way. You could have also done it analytically, or you could have done it with simulation. But it has a particularly nice analogy now that we're going to start to think about control. So again, what do I mean by control? Control here is going to be the fact that ultimately we don't care about just evaluating policies. Typically, we want our agent to actually be learning policies. Um, and so in this case, we're not going to when we're not going to really talk about learning policies. We're just going to be talking about computing optimal policies. So the important thing is that there exists a unique optimal value function. So um, and the optimal policy for an MDP in an infinite horizon finite state MDP is deterministic. So that's one really good reason why it's sufficient for us to just focus on deterministic policies, so sort of finite state MDPs um, in infinite horizons. Okay, so how do we compute it? Well, first, before we do this, let's think about how many policies there might be. So there are seven discrete states. In this case, it's the lo locations of the rover. There are two actions. I won't call them left and right. I'm just going to call them A1 and A2. Because left and right kind of implies that you will definitely achieve that. We can also just think of these as generally being stochastic scenarios. So let's just call them A1 and A2. Then the question is, how many deterministic policies are there? And is the optimal policy for an MDP always unique? So again, might we just take like one minute or so, one or two minutes? Feel free to talk to a neighbor about how many deterministic policies there are for this particular case. And then if that's um, the, once you've answered that, it's fine to think about in general if you have S states and A actions, and this is the cardinality of those sets, how many possible deterministic policies are there? Um, and then the second question, which is whether or not these are always unique. Okay, does anybody want to take a guess at how many deterministic policies there are in this case? Yeah. <laughs> this could be wrong, but it's, it's a mapping from states to actions, so would it be 2 to the 7th? Because you have 
That's exactly what right. That is, it's a mapping. Uh, if we remember back to our definition of what a policy is, a mapping is going to be a map from states to actions. So what that means in this case is that there are two choices for every state, and there are seven states. And more generally, that the number of policies is a to the s. So it can be large. It's exponential in the state space, um, but it's finite. So it's bounded. Um, anyone want to take a guess of whether or not the optimal policy is always unique? I told you the value function is unique. Um, is the policy unique? Yeah. And I think there might be cases where it's not unique. This is exactly right. Um, it's not always unique. The value function is unique, but there may be cases where you get ties. And so there might be that there are two actions that, um, or two policies that have the same value. So no. Depends on the process. By a unique optimal value function? Uh, yes. So the Camilla's question is can I explain what I mean by there's a unique optimal value function? I mean that the optimal value of the state, so um, the expected discounted sum of returns, um, there is uh, there may be more than one optimal policy, but there exists at least one optimal policy which leads to the maximum value for that state. Um, and there, there's a single value of that. We'll talk about, it'll probably be a little bit clearer too when we talk about contraction properties later. Um, that there's sort of, a, this is a, so for each state, it's just a scalar value. It says exactly what is the expected discounted sum of returns, and this is the maximum expected discounted sum of returns under the optimal policy. Yeah. I'm Adam, and on the note of how many true policies there are present, uh, when we first defined policies, I thought it was describing uh, the entire hash table with sort of one action per state, rather than saying all possible combinations. So I'm a little surprised that two to the seven, rather than being just the number of states with each one being mapped specifically to a single action. Yes. Yeah, question is for me to sort of better clarify, you know, what the what this, um, how many policies there are, and whether maybe <laughs> there maybe it looked like it was going to be linear and it's actually exponential. Um, the way that we're defining a decision policy here, um, a, a deterministic decision policy, is a mapping from a state to an action, and so that means for each state we get to choose an action. And so just as an illustration of why this ends up being exponential, um, so in this case, let's imagine instead of having seven states, we just have six, two states. So now we have S1 and S2. <clears throat> so you could either have action A1, A1, you could have action A1, A2, you could have action A2, A1, or action A2, A2. And you have to, and all of those are distinct policies. So that's why the space ends up being exponential. When you have like A to the power of S, I'm assuming that A refers to legal actions per state, assuming like you could have different actions depending on the state. The question is whether or not you might be able to have different constraints on the action space for state. Absolutely. So in this case, today for simplicity, we're going to assume that all actions are applicable in all states. Um, in reality, that's often not true. Um, uh, in, in many real world cases, um, some of the actions might be specific to the state. Uh, you know, for totally, there's a huge space of medical interventions. Um, uh, for many of them, they might not be at all uh, even reasonable to ever consider um, for certain states or applicable. Um, so uh, in general, you can have different action subspaces per state, and then you would take the, the product over the actions, the cardinality of the action set that is relevant for each of the states. But for right now, I think it's simplest just to think of it as there's one uniform action space, and they can be applied at any state. Okay, so um, the optimal policy for an MDP in a finite horizon problem where the agent acts forever um, is deterministic. It's stationary, which means it doesn't depend on the time step. We started talking about that a little bit last time. Um, so it means that if I'm in this state, if I'm in state S7, there's an optimal policy for being in state S7, whether I encounter that at time step one, time step 37, time step 242. Stationary. Um, and, and one of the intuitions for this is that if you get to act forever, there's always like an infinite number of future time steps no matter when you're at. So if you would always do action A1 from state S7 now, um, then if you encounter it again in 50 time steps, you still have an infinite amount of time to go from there, and so you'd still take the same action if that was the optimal thing to do. And as we were just discussing, it's not, the optimal policy is not necessarily unique um, because you might have. Uh, more than one policy with the same value function. 
So how would we compute this? One option is policy search. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about this in a few weeks when we're talking about function approximation and having really, really large state spaces. Um, but even in tabular cases, uh, we can just think of searching. So the number of deterministic policies we just discussed is a to the s. Um, and policy iteration is a technique that is generally better than enumeration. So what do I mean by enumeration in this context? I mean, there's a finite number of policies. You could just evaluate each of them separately and then pick the max. So if you have a lot of compute, you might just want to, and this might be better if you really care about wall clock and you have many, many, many processors, you could just do this exhaustively. You could just try all of your policies, evaluate all of them, either analytically or iteratively or whatever scheme you want to use and then take the max over all of them. But if you don't have kind of infinite compute, it's generally more computationally efficient if you have to do this serially to do policy iteration. And so we'll talk about what that is. So in policy iteration, what we do is we basically keep track of a guess of what the optimal policy might be. We evaluate its value and then we try to improve it. If we can't improve it anymore, um, well then we can, then we can halt. So, the idea is that we start by initializing randomly. Here now you can think of the subscript as indexing which policy we're at. So initially we start off with some random policy and then pi i is always gonna index sort of our current guess of what the optimal policy might be. So what we do is we initialize our policy randomly and while it's not changing, and we'll talk about whether or not it can change or go back to the same one in a second, we do value function policy, we evaluate the policy using the same sorts of techniques we just discussed, because it's a fixed policy, which means we are now basically in a Markov reward um, process. And then we do policy improvement. And so the really the new thing compared to what we were doing before now is policy improvement. So in order to define how we could improve a policy, we're gonna define something new, which is the state action value. So before we were just talking about state values, state values are denoted by V. We're talking about like v pi of s, which says if you start in state s and you follow policy pi, what is the expected discounted sum of rewards? A state action value says, well, I'm gonna follow this policy pi, but not right away. I'm gonna first take an action a, which might be different than what my policy is telling me to do. And then later on the next time step, I'm gonna follow policy pi. So it just says I'm gonna get my immediate reward from taking this action A that I'm choosing. And then I'm gonna to transition to a new state. Again, that depends on my current state and the action I just took. And from then on, I'm gonna take policy pi. Okay. So that defines the Q function. And what policy improvement does is it says, okay, you've got a policy. You just did policy evaluation and you got a value of it. So policy evaluation just allowed you to compute what was the value of that policy. And now I wanna see if I can improve it. Now remember right now we're in the case where we know the dynamics model and we know the reward model. So what we can do then is we can do this sort of Q computation where we say, okay, well I've got that previous value function of my policy and now I compute Q pi, which says if I take a different action could be the same. We do this for all A and for all S. So for all A and all S, we compute this. And then we're gonna compute a new policy, and this is the improvement step, which maximizes this Q. So we just do this computation, and then we take the max. Now by definition, this has to be greater than or equal to Q pi I of S pi i of a, right? Because either a is equal to pi i of a, but sorry, pi i of s. So either you, the arg max is gonna be the same as that your previous policy, pi i, or it's gonna be different. And the only time you're gonna pick it differently is if the, the Q function of that alternative action is better. So by definition, this Q pi, the max over A of Q pi I of S A has to be greater than or equal to Q pi I of S times pi I of 
Question in the back. Is this kind of going to be susceptible to kind of finding like a local maxima though, and then you kind of just get stuck there if there's like some coupling between different actions? Question said, okay, so this is going to allow us to maybe do some local monotonic improvement, maybe, um, but are we going to be susceptible to getting stuck? Um, in fact, uh, for any of you that have played around with reinforcement learning and policy gradient and stuff, that is exactly one of the problems that can happen when we start doing gradient-based approaches. Nicely, in this case, this does not occur. So we're guaranteed to converge to the, local, uh, to the global optima, and we'll see why for a second. Okay. All right, so this is how it works. You do this policy evaluation, and then you compute the Q function, and then you compute the new policy that takes an argmax of the Q function. So that's how policy improvement works. The next critical question that Aris was bringing up is, okay, why do we do this and is this a good idea? So when we look at this, um, let's look through this step a little bit more. What we're gonna get is we're gonna get um, this sort of interesting type of policy improvement step. And it's kind of involving a few different things, so I just sort of wanna highlight the subtlety of it. So what is happening here is that we compute this Q function, and then we've got this. We've got max over A of Q pi I of S A has to be greater than or equal to R of S of pi A, the previous policy that we were using before. So what I've done there is I've said, okay, the max action over the Q has to be at least as good as following your old policy by definition, because otherwise you could always pick the same policy as before or else you're gonna pick a better action. And this reward function here is just exactly the definition of the value of your old policy. So that means that your, the max over your Q function has to be at least as good as the old value you had. So that's encouraging. But here's the weird part. So when we do this, if we instead take argmax, we're gonna get our new policy. So what is this doing? It's saying, I'm computing this new Q function. What does this Q function represent? It represents if I take an action and then I follow my old policy from then onwards. And then I'm picking whatever action is maximizing that quantity for each state. Okay, so I'm gonna do this process for each state. But then, so that's gonna just define a new policy, right? Like a, that might be the same or it could be a, a different policy than the one you've had before. Here's the weird thing. So this is saying that if you were to follow that argmax A and then follow your old policy from then onwards, you would be guaranteed to be doing better than you were before. But the strange thing is that we're not gonna follow the old policy from then onwards. We are going to follow this new policy for all time. So remember what we are doing is we're completely changing our policy and then we're gonna evaluate that new policy for all time steps, not just for the first time step and then follow the old policy from then on. So it should be at least a little unclear that this is a good thing to do. <laughs> it should be like, okay, so you're, you're saying that if I were to take this one different action and then follow my old policy, then I know that my value would be better than before. But what you really want is that this new policy is just better overall. And so the cool thing is that you can show that by doing this policy improvement, it is monotonically better than the old policy. Okay. So this is just saying this out in words. We're saying, you know, if we took the new policy for one action and follow pi i forever, then we're guaranteed to be at least as good as we were before in terms of our value function. But our new proposed policy is just to always follow this new policy. Okay, so why do we get a monotonic improvement in the policy value by doing this? So in the policy value. So what, first of all, what do I mean by monotonic improvement? Um, what I mean is that the value, uh, something is monotonic if um, the new policy is greater than or equal to the old policy for all states. So it has to either have the same value or be better. And my proposition is that the new policy is greater than or equal to the old policy in all states with strict inequality if the old policy was suboptimal. So why does this work? 
so it works for the following reasons. Let's go ahead and just like walk through the proof briefly. Okay, so this is what we've said here is that um, v pi i of s, that's our old value of our policy, so this is like our old policy value, has to be less than or equal to max a of q pi i of s a. And this is just by definition, uh, let me write it like this. is equal to r of s of pi i plus 1 of s. Because remember, the way that we defined pi of i plus 1 of s is just equal to the policy that match, maximizes the q pi i. Okay. So this is going to be by definition. So I've gotten rid of the max there. So this is going to be less than or equal to R, the same thing at the beginning, times max over A of our Q pi I. Again, by definition, because we've said at the first thing there that we know that v pi i of s prime would also be less than or equal to max over a of q pi i of s prime a prime. Okay, so we just made that substitution. And then we can re-expand this part using our reward. So this is going to be max over a prime r of s prime a prime plus dot dot dot. I'm basically making that substitution from that line into there. So I'm nesting it. I'm re-expanding what the definition is of q pi. And if you keep doing this forever, essentially we just keep pushing in as if we get to continue to take pi i plus 1 on all future time steps. And what the key thing to notice here is that this is a greater than or equal to. So if you nest this in completely, what you get is that this is the value of pi i plus 1. So there's kind of two key tricks in here. The, the first thing is to say, notice that the v pi i is always lower, is a lower bound to max a over q pi. And then to re-express this using the definition of pi i plus 1. And then to re-upper bound that v by q pi. And just keep re-expanding it. And so you can do this out. And then that allows you to redefine to when you've substituted in for all actions using pi i plus 1, then you've now defined what the value is of pi i plus 1. So this is what it allows us to know that the new pi i plus 1 value is by definition at least as good as the previous value function. So I just put that in there more neatly. All right, so the next questions that might come up is, so we know we're going to get this monotonic improvement. Um, so the questions would be, if the policy doesn't change, can it ever change again? And is there a maximum number of iterations of policy iteration? So what do I mean by iterations here? Iterations is i. So kind of how many policies could we step through? So why don't we take like a minute and just think about this, maybe talk to somebody around you that you haven't met before, and see what you think of these two questions. So the policy is monotonically improving, and is there a maximum number of iterations this will run for? Just in the interest of time for today, just in the interest of time for today, because I want us to try to get through value iteration as well. Um, why does it, does somebody want to give me um, a guess of whether or not the policy can ever, if the policy stops changing, whether it can ever change again. So what I mean by that is that if the policy at pi, so the question here was to say if pi of i plus 1 is equal to pi i for all states, could it ever change again? So I may want to share a guess of whether or not that's true. Once it has stopped changing, it can never change again. So no. And the second question is, um, is there a maximum number of policy iterations? 
there, there's no you could have more iterations than there are policies. That's right. So there, we know that there is at most A to the S policies. You cannot repeat a policy ever um, because of this monotonic improvement. And so they, there's a maximum number of iterations. Great. And this just, um, I'll skip through this now just so we can go through a bit of value iteration, but this just steps through to show a little bit more of how once your policies stop changing, essentially your Q pi will be identical, and so you can't, uh, there's no policy improvement to, to, be, your, to change. After it's sort of converged, you're going to stay there forever. Okay, so policy iteration computes um, the optimal value in a policy in one way. The idea in policy iteration is you always have a policy um, that, is, that you know the value of it for the infinite horizon, and then you incrementally try to improve it. Value iteration is an alternative approach. Value iteration instead says, we're gonna think of computing the optimal value if you get to act for a finite number of steps. The beginning just one step, and then two steps, and then three steps, et cetera. Um, and you just keep iterating to longer and longer. So that's different, right? Because policy says you always have a policy and you know what its value is, it just might not be very good. Value iteration says you always know what the optimal value in policy is, but only if you're gonna to get to act for, say, k time steps. So they're just, they're computing different things. Um, and they both will converge to the same thing eventually. So when we start to talk about value iteration, it's useful to think about Bellman. Um, so the Bellman equation and Bellman backup operators are things that are often talked about in uh, Markov decision processes and reinforcement learning. So this constraint here that we've seen before, which says that the value of a policy is its immediate reward plus its discounted sum of future rewards, um, is known as the Bellman equation. The constraint for a Markov process, a Markov decision process, it has to satisfy that. And we can alternatively, like what we were just seeing before, think of this as, um, as a backup operator, which means that we can apply it to an old value function and transform it to a new value function. So just like what we were doing in some of the um, uh, evaluation of a policy, we can also sort of do these operators. In this case, the difference compared to what we've seen with evaluation before is we're taking a max there. So we're taking this max A over the, the best immediate reward we could get plus the discounted sum of future rewards. So sometimes we'll use the notation of BV to mean a Bellman operator, which means you take your old V and then you plug it into here and you do this operation. So how does value iteration work? The algorithm can be summarized as follows. You start off, you can initialize your value function to zero for all states, and then you loop until you converge. Um, or if you're doing a finite horizon, which we might not have time to get to today, but um, I, then you'd go to that horizon. And basically for each state, you do this Bellman backup operator. So you say, my value at k plus one time steps for that state is if I get to pick the best immediate action plus the discounted sum of future rewards using that old value function I had from the previous time step. And that vk said, what is the optimal thing, my optimal value for that state, s prime, given that I got to act for k more time steps. So that's why initializing it to zero is a good thing to do because in this case, or it's certainly a reasonable thing to do if you want these all to be the optimal as if you had that many time steps to go. If you have no more time steps to act, your value is zero. The first backup you do will basically say what is the optimal immediate action you should take if you only get to take one action. And then after that, you start backing up. Um, and continue and say, well, what if I got to act for two time steps? What if I got to act for three time steps? What's the best sequence of decisions you could do in each of those cases? Um, again, just in terms of Bellman operations, if we think back to sort of what policy iteration is doing, you could instantiate this Bellman operator by fixing what the policy is. And so if you see sort of a B with um, a pi on top, it's saying, well, instead of taking that max over actions, you're specifying what is the action you get to take. So policy evaluation, you can think of as basically just computing a fixed point of repeatedly applying this Bellman backup until V stops converging and stops changing. <coughs> so um, in terms of policy iteration, this is very similar to what we saw before. You can think of it in these Bellman operators and doing this argmax. I want to see if we can get to a little bit on sort of the contraction operator. 
So this is what um, value iteration does. It's very similar to policy iteration and evaluation. Um, let me talk a little bit about the contraction aspect. So for any operator, um, let's let O be an operator and X denote a norm of X. So X could be a vector, like a value function. And then you could look at like an L2 norm or an L1 norm or an L infinity norm. So if you want to, if an operator is a contraction, it means that if you apply it to two different things, you can think of these as value functions, um, then the distance between them shrinks after, um, or at least is no bigger, after you apply the operator compared to their distance before. So just to, um, actually, I'll, I'll save examples for later. Feel free to come up to me after class if you want to see an example of this, um, or I can do it on Piazza. But this is sort of the formal definition of what it means to be a contraction, is that the distance between, in this case, we're going to think about as two vectors, um, doesn't get bigger and can shrink after you apply this operator. So the key question of whether or not value iteration will converge is because the Bellman backup is a contraction operator. And it's a contraction operator as long as gamma is less than one, which means that if you do, if, let's say you have two different, bell, uh, two different value functions, and then you did the Bellman backup on both of them, then the distance between them would shrink. So how do we prove this? Um, we prove it, for interest of time, I'll show you the proof. Again, I'm happy to go through it, um, uh, or we can go through it in office hours, et cetera. Let me just show it kind of briefly. Um, so the idea to, to prove that the Bellman backup is a contraction operator is we consider there being two different value functions, k and j, they don't have to be, this has, doesn't have to be anything to do with value iteration. These are just two different value functions. One could be, you know, one, three, seven, two, and the other one could be five, six, nine, eight. Okay, so we just have two different vectors of value functions. And then we re-express what they are after we apply the Bellman backup operator. So there's that max A, the immediate reward, plus the discounted sum of future rewards, where we've plugged in our two different value functions. And then what we say there is, well, if you get to pick that max A separately for those two, the distance between those is lower bounded than if you kind of try to maximize that difference there by putting that max A in. And then you can cancel the rewards. So that's what happens in the third line. And then the next thing we can do is we can bound and say the difference between these two value functions is, diff is um, bounded by the max norm of the distance between those two. So you can pick the places at which those value functions most differ. And then you can move it out of the sum, and now you're subbing over a probability distribution that has to sum to one. And that gives you this. And so that means that the Bellman backup, as long as this is less than one, has to be a contraction operator. The distance between the two value functions can't be larger after you apply the Bellman operator than it was before. Okay. So, I think a good exercise to do um, is to then say, given that it's a contraction operator, um, that means it has to converge to a fixed point. There has to be a unique solution. So if you apply the Bellman operator repeatedly, there's a single fixed point that you will go to, which is a single um, vector of value, uh, values. It's also good to think about whether the initialization of values impacts anything if you only care about the result after it's converged. All right, so um, I think we can halt there. Class is basically over. There's a little bit more in the slides to talk about um, the finite horizon case. Um, and feel free to reach out to us on Piazza with any questions. Thanks.